There's been a boom in lip procedures over the past 10 years, and there are no signs of it slowing down. Let's review some of the non-surgical and surgical options for optimizing your lips in 2024. So some non-surgical options include makeup. Someone's even come out with the name lip lift for just applying makeup by overlining your lips. So that's very confusing when you're trying to decide between a surgical lip lift and then this like non-surgical makeup option. And makeup Makeup can surely transform how your lips look, everyone knows that, and that can be a nice safe option for many people. Next option is Botox. That is called a lip flip when about four to five units are injected along the vermilion border of the upper lip and that can slightly evert the upper lip, but usually the impact is very minimal. Maybe maximum you get like a half a millimeter of lift, so most patients don't come back for repeated treatments, they find that it never really did anything in the first place. Next, we have filler, and this is something that many people are familiar with. Most commonly, hyaluronic acid, or AHA, is used as the filler of choice for lips. And specifically, you want a filler that is low G prime, meaning a filler that's not too dense or too thick. My preference with AHA filler is to use it into the body of the red lip, whether it's the upper lip and or the lower lip but I don't like it for the vermilion border. What happens when you inject the vermilion border is that you tend to get migration over time. So it starts to spill out into the cutaneous portion of the lip. And similarly, when people inject the filtral columns with filler, it usually ends up not looking too natural over time. So I usually advise to avoid filler in those locations. And then we have thread lifting. So some people have tried these different thread approaches to the upper lip to try to lift it. But again, these results are short-lived. They tend to not really last and they don't look very good. I've never seen a thread lift for the upper lip that looked impressive even right after it was done. So it's out there, it's an option, but it's usually not recommended. And the other non-surgical option for augmenting the lips is the plasma pen. So this is basically a cautery type of device that's used along the upper cutaneous lip to try to tighten that skin. But it tends to not really do a whole lot. And most people are dissatisfied with the impact that it has. Some people you've seen on TikTok are using it for the upper eyelid. Other people are using it on the upper lip itself. But in both places, it tends to not do a whole lot and it can still cause some degree of scar tissue to form. Now let's move into surgical options for augmenting your lips. I've broken this down into different areas that can be manipulated, specifically the red lip itself, the vermilion border, and then you have the nasal base. So depending on where you're doing the manipulation, we'll go through the various options in those categories. When it comes to enhancing the actual red lip, one option is a fat transfer. This is fat that's taken somewhere else from the body, like the abdomen or sometimes the flank, and it's processed and then injected into the actual red lips. So this is an alternative to HA filler, and it's meant to be a bit more long-lasting, though it usually doesn't necessarily last forever because about 50% of the fat that's injected will be resorbed by the body. And sometimes, since that fat has actually memory from where it came from, so let's say the abdomen, if someone gains weight later in life, the lips will get fuller because it's still their abdominal fat that's now in their lips. So it's harder to, to control exactly what happens to that fat over time and that's why it can be a little bit risky. Also, you can get uh, little lumps that form from the injections and then you'd have to go in and surgically remove them because there's no dissolving agent for fat, at least not one that you'd wanna use in your lips. Another surgical option for the red lips is to do an implant. These silicone-based implants were more popular about a decade ago. Basically, they're solid pieces of silicone, just like someone would get a cheek implant with silicone uh, or like a chin implant. So something similar is used in the, you know, in the shape of, of something that would go into your lip. And it's a smaller surgical procedure to fit it into the area. And it can add some fullness and a little bit of shape to the lip. But many patients don't really like the way that it feels. I have seen it look pretty good and be non-bothersome to some patients. But many patients who get these implants tend to later on get them explanted because they're just not happy with how it looks or how it feels. Another surgical 
typical option for the red lips is to do a V to Y advancement. Now this can be done for the upper lip or the lower lip, and it's an incision that's made on the inside, whether it's upper or lower, and it advances the tissue forward and it gives more fullness to the lips. And some patients ask me if I offer this procedure, and this is not my go-to procedure because it tends to create a redundancy of the mucosal tissue. And then what happens is some people feel like they're biting on the tissue when they're eating and it just gets in their way and it might give them a fuller upper or lower lip temporarily, but then over time, that tissue redundancy tends to be a bit floppy. And then people seek out like, let's say a um, lip reduction to try to remove some of that excess. So I haven't seen great results long term with the Vita Y advancement. Also, it does nothing for shortening the filtrum itself. So that's one of the limitations of it. And so I tend to not utilize it as a surgical technique, but it's something that's out there and it's been around for a long time. And some people still like to incorporate that into their lip augmentation routine. Now, when it comes to surgical options at the vermilion border, there are several. The first is a gull wing, sometimes called a seagull or a direct lip lift. This is basically tracing the entire vermilion border of let's say the upper lip and using that to then advance that tissue up and you're going to be everting the red lip in that manner. Similarly, you can do this on the lower lip and that's called a lower lip advancement where again the incision is made across the entire uh, vermilion border of that lower lip to advance it forward and to basically evert it out so the lip looks fuller. It could be a nice option for some people. My biggest qualm with the upper lip direct lift is that when you're tracing with a with an incision right on the cupid's bow you're never going to be able to fully recreate it when you go and stitch it up there's always going to be a blurring of those distinct lines of the cupid's bow and that to me is what gives it a very artificial look. It looks very nice right when it's done, if you look at like the, the TikTok of videos or whatever, but then once it heals, there's this blurring of, of that line at the cupid's bow, and that really is problematic. So for that central segment in particular, I don't think directly cutting on the vermilion border is the right way to go. Now, more laterally, we have an option called a corner lift or a grin lift. These incisions are also placed Placed at the vermilion border but lateral to the cupid's bow. Usually when I do my corner lip lift the medial segment is going to be going right up to where the cupid's bow starts. So if you're cutting right from there all the way lateral out to the commissure that tends to be better healing and it tends to blur the borders less especially in the critical zone which is that central zone. As I've spoken about separately in my video about frowning some people do this kind of extended corner lip lift where their incision comes off of the vermilion border and they do this to help improve some of that downturned oral commissure that some people get and they lift that entire segment. Now the problem with that approach is that the scar can sometimes be quite visible. So I usually avoid that grin lift lateral extension and I like to use my incision right along the vermilion border hugging the oral commissure coming down towards the lower vermilion border. Vermilion border incisions are not all bad, but when you work into that central region, that's where you start to see the most artificial or let's just say least natural type of result as opposed to making those vermilion border incisions more lateral those tend to heal better and that's the way that i employ them in my practice and now we get to the surgical options for nasal base type of work now the first option here is an italian type of lip lift and what that is is that basically you're not so much lifting the center your incisions are right at the the nasal sills on both sides and they're two separate incisions versus one continuous incision and for some people they would prefer this because they'd rather the center not really go up much. So a couple of things to say about that. One is that the reason to make one continuous incision at the base of the nose is that you're offloading tension. When you have tension gathered up at two areas, those incisions tend to heal worse than an area that's more extended at the base of the nose where the tension is now shared amongst all these different segments 
of that incision. So that is one of the reasons why I don't like the Italian lip lift. Also, people think that they're gonna get their corners lifted with the Italian lift, but that's still at the base of the nose. So you're truly not gonna get the corners to lift much with the Italian approach. So you're still getting some degree of that central two thirds of the upper lip to lift, but now your scarring is potentially worse because you've separated your incision. So it's not my preference, but it's a technique that's out there and that's been described many years ago. The next surgical option at the nasal base is a more endonasal approach where the area by the nasal sill that the incision there is going to be hidden more internally. So as you come around the ala, as, as you make that incision, some people like to go internal into the nose and then come out right at the calumella and then go in again as they get to the other side. And some patients ask me, can you do that approach because I want the incision to be more hidden? It sounds great. It, it really does sound great. The problem with it is that now you're essentially pulling the lip tissue into the nose, right? You're you're blurring those boundaries of the lip segment from the nasal segment. Um, the nasal sill is where the lip ends and the nose begins. If you're taking the lip and you're putting it into the nose, there's again this kind of uh, artificial appearance that unfolds and even though that incision is a bit more hidden, there's something that just looks off about that area because in many cases you're actually removing the nasal sill and that just doesn't look right most of the time. Then we get to bullhorn and subnasal approaches to lip lifting. There are a few versions of this. One is to do a skin only type of excision. The skin in the area of the upper lip is quite thick. So if you just remove the outer layers, pretty much the epidermis and the dermis, and then you just go to suture the tissue, you're gonna get, again, a lot of tension that forms, and that tension is gonna lead to worse healing worse scars. I prefer not to do a skin only type of removal. And that is um, something that many people still offer, just like for facelifting. Some people just lift the skin and that's it. But I think we've learned over the years in plastic surgery that trying to lift the deeper tissues and truly reposition the deeper tissues and offload tension from the surface onto the deeper tissues is usually much better for healing. So that's why I apply that philosophy to lip lift surgery. So then we have a bullhorn subnasal approach, but with a deep plane type of dissection. And that in my practice is called the ELA lift, E-L-E-L-Y-F-T. Other people just call it the deep plane lip lift, but we're all basically doing something similar when we do that type of deep plane approach where we're trying to come down right onto the orbicularis muscle. So we're going through all the layers of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue onto the muscle. Now, some people choose to manipulate the muscle and do a hemming or cut away at some of the muscle. I prefer to leave that muscle intact so that we don't mess with the function of the lip. And I find that the results from a deep plane lip lift where you don't mess with the muscle last just as long as the ones where you are suturing the muscle. And what some surgeons do is an extended bullhorn type of approach where the lateral incision from the subnasal approach is actually swung around much higher. So it goes all the way around the ala, and then the incision laterally runs all the way along the nasolabial fold. And sometimes their dissection is down to the actual vermilion border. So all that tissue is lifted. And by doing so, they say that they're going to make the nasolabial folds less obvious, that they're going to allow for eversion of the lateral uh, lip or the corner lip. Um, in reality, what ends up happening when you try that really extended approach, first of all, the healing takes longer. It's a more difficult recovery process. You're much more likely to get webbed scars along that lateral ala as you swing up. You really don't see the corners lifting as much as people claim they do with that approach because, again, you're still just working at the base of your nose. And the nasolabial folds, even if initially they look less obvious or more blunted, Truth is, over the course of six months or a year, they really look like they did preoperatively. So 
I tend not to do this type of extended bullhorn approach or peri ailer approach, um, but some surgeons do like that technique. Now that we've gone through some of the non-surgical and surgical options for enhancing your lips, let's talk about some of my latest thoughts on lip lift procedures. I wanted to caution you guys to not be swayed by some of the AI images that you're seeing online. Many of the images that we're presented with online, especially you know, TikTok, Instagram, um, they're adjusted, whether it's Photoshop, some editing tool, some sort of AI image of a person that's not even real. Make sure that you're not trying to, to chase these types of results on people who don't even exist. If you're looking to find out like what might you look like after you know said procedure, make sure to look through the before and after galleries on my website or another surgeon's website to get a realistic idea of what's possible. And make sure that when you're looking at those images that the before and after have similar lighting, similar angulation, that it doesn't look like all the images have um, the after in, in makeup, for example, because, you know, some people will come in for their after image with, with makeup on. But if you do these procedures often enough, you'll obviously see um, a mix of different patients. Some will come in with makeup, some without. So when you're looking at these galleries, make sure you really get a sense of, you know, what is the average here? And I think that will give you the best idea of what's actually possible versus what you just are dreaming of, but maybe is impossible from a specific lip procedure. Now, when it comes to the question of how much to remove with a bullhorn style lip lift or the L lift that I do, the average amount that we end up removing for a primary lip lift is four to six millimeters. But a four millimeter lift is very different from a six millimeter lift. Each millimeter or half a millimeter really does change the look. So you have to make sure that you're adjusting how much you remove based on the patient's anatomy and of course their goals. And sometimes we go less than four millimeters for the right candidate and sometimes we're going above six millimeters. So again, four to six is the most common range, but sometimes it can fall outside of that range. Now, in terms of what is the maximum amount of skin that you can remove, or another way to phrase this is what's the minimum filtral length that you should leave behind? That's a question that I sometimes get. Now, the industry standard, again, this is among lip lift surgeons, people who do this often, is that you can leave seven millimeters of filtrum when you're not on stretch and about 10 millimeters of filtrum when you are on stretch. Now, what that means is that if you're just putting a caliper to the filtrum without stretching the tissue, if you have seven millimeters, that's usually a, a safe amount of filtral length to leave behind. However, another way to measure that same filtrum is to put it on stretch. So once you start stretching the tissue, if you can stretch it to at least 10 millimeters of length, that again is usually a safe amount to leave behind. Now this has been documented in our literature and this is what we go by in, in modern lip lift surgery to figure out how much tissue you know, should we leave behind as we're planning out a lip lift surgery for somebody. People figure, well, I'm getting a lip lift and I'm gonna be numb anyway. Why don't they just put some filler in at the same time because I'm, I'm already there, I'm numb. The problem with that is that as you go to numb up the lip, you start to get swelling. So you get this distorted type of look and it's very difficult then to say how much filler should you add to this part of the lip or that part of the lip. So that in my opinion is not the right time to introduce filler. My recommendation is to wait about three months after a lip lift to do filler. So I think whether or not you're getting a fat transfer to the lips or HA filler is going to be used. In my opinion, it's best to wait about three months to let the lips settle down before you go back and start introducing some other agent to further augment the lip because you wanna see what exactly you get from just the lip lift itself. It's very difficult to preemptively know exactly how much of the fat to inject or how much of the HA filler to inject to further enhance the lip. Now, when it comes to post-operative care, I'm a big proponent of scar gel that usually starts around 10 to 12 days after the surgery, once there's no more bubbling, if you were to test it with a hydrogen peroxide. And my scar gel of choice is the one that we made, our Feel Confident Scar Gel, because of its matte finish, because of how quickly it dries, and the oils that are in that scar gel to further promote wound healing. It's important to apply sunscreen 
over that scar gel um, to, of course, protect from the sun and to optimize your healing even more. For patients who travel in from out of state, let's say, or from other countries, they have a few options when it comes to follow-up and suture removal. Some patients decide to stay in New York for about a week and we remove the sutures then, five to seven days after their surgery. Some people will actually travel back home and then they'll come back to us at that five to seven day window to get the sutures out. Other patients will actually go back home and find a, a surgeon, a qualified surgeon, in their home state or country to remove their sutures. And the only thing I ask there is that they've really thought it through and they've made that appointment way in advance because I've had some patients try last minute, no one will take them in. They try to go to an urgent care, urgent care doesn't know what to do. And then they end up last minute trying to fly out to see us. And it's just always a hassle uh, for them when that occurs. So you just wanna really plan things out for your follow-up care. I think it's very important that doctors are able to identify post-operative viral and or bacterial infections that can occur after a lip lift. They present a little differently from some other parts of the body or of the face. It usually doesn't look like a, a big abscess that's blowing up. Usually you have a more of a cellulitis on the area or like a honeycombing of the area. Uh, sometimes you'll get these little uh, whitish or yellowish vesicles that can uh, indicate a viral infection. And so those need to be treated. So if you're getting your sutures out in another place, you need to make sure that the, the doctor, the physician, the surgeon in that place is familiar with seeing, you know, various complications after these surgeries and namely um, infection because it does occur. I mean, it doesn't occur commonly. Uh, it's pretty rare, but it can occur after a lip lift. Now, briefly on the use of Kenalog. So this is a steroid. Anytime we have hypertrophic scar, uh, it's a good idea to use steroid to bring down and flatten that scar. Most people will need a series of injections. And lately what I've been doing is if somebody has thick skin that I determined during the surgery, I'll inject them with Kenalog 10 as they're you know, still numb and we're, we're just about done with the surgery. And that tends to reduce the incidence of hypertrophic scar. But again, it's only for patients who already have thick skin because that in my practice, uh, what I've observed has been a, a big indicator for whether or not someone's at a higher risk for developing hypertrophic scar in the post-operative setting. So if we can do something to try to prevent it, like injecting the steroid, then we're going to do it. And remember that full lip lift healing can take up to a year. So you go through these different stages of healing, the first two weeks being you know, the worst of it, but there's still some gradual healing that has to occur. And for the scar to fully mature, all that can take about a year. And we have a dedicated video on post-operative healing from lip lift surgery. So make sure to check that one out. Now, when it comes to revision surgery after a lip lift, I find that most patients who end up wanting a revision usually know within the first month after surgery that they're probably going to want a bit more removed. And in my practice, it's about 5% of patients who come back wanting more. I do recommend waiting for at least three months before we actually do the revision procedure because you want some time to go by for the healing to, to take place. And then you can go back in, you know, and, and do it again if that's what the patient wants and if there's a enough philtrum um, to work with. Keep in mind that with a revision lip lift, there's more arching that occurs, right? Every time that you do a lip lift, there's going to be more arching of that upper lip. So it's something to remember because some patients, they get one, they're like, you know, this is great, but can we make the philtrum shorter? We sometimes can, but it's going to come with even more arching of that upper lip and they need to be comfortable with that change. I also find that revision lip lifts tend to have a slightly slower recovery and there's usually a little bit more discomfort um, with the actual recovery. It's not much more than the original surgery, but the area just is kind of sensitive. And so the, the healing is a little slower and there's a little bit more sensitivity to the area, but more or less the patients do great with a revision procedure that's done properly. Now for a corner lip lift, I usually prefer to do a 
classic bullhorn deep plane lift first, and then wait about three months, see how things settle out, and then we can consider a corner lip lift if the corners are rolled in. Now, there are some patients that when they present on initial evaluation, the corners are already rolled in. So for some of those patients, we do have the conversation of potentially doing a lip lift bullhorn style and a corner lip lift at the same time. I've warmed up to this idea um, over the years, but it's something that I'd like to be quite selective with, and it has to really be done um, for the right patient. Uh, but when there's that pretty severe roll in initially, we know that the lip lift will only enhance that appearance. So adding the corner lift at the same time might be helpful for those patients. So I do find that surgical results do tend to lead to more natural, long-lasting outcomes for patients when it comes to their lips compared to some non-surgical options. But not everybody is a great surgical candidate. That could be based on their anatomy, it could be based on their risk tolerance, or it could be just based on some other comorbidities. So each person has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and properly guided towards a lip augmentation strategy that might be right for them. If you are opting for surgery, make sure that you understand the risks and benefits of the procedure that you're signing up for. Don't sign forms if you don't understand what they're about or what type of procedure you know, you're going in for. Make sure you really know what you're signing and make sure that you have you know, a conversation with your doctor in advance uh, to understand what else is possible and what are your alternatives. Remember that with surgery, these are permanent changes that may be difficult to reverse. So really think it through before signing up. It's very important. And my final note is that you should trust the surgeon that you initially picked to do your surgery to help you through the recovery process and to guide you towards an optimal outcome.